Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we are very excited to um, open our conversation about intermediaries and aggregators to the wider um, sector. Um, and we'll have our webinar today with uh, expert from, experts from Gempass and, and Urban Sports Club um, on the role of intermediaries and aggregators in the fitness sector ecosystem uh, during and post COVID-19. Before we get to our uh, panelists, uh, Robbie, could you um, go to the next slide, please? And the next one. Thank you. Um, in our uh, strategy, as you're active in our strategy for uh, 2020 and 2021, we are mentioning uh, digital as one of the three major uh, issues that we see as, as the, the most important developments of our sector over the coming um, decade health being one of them, um, digital being one of them, and our interactions and, and um, being uh, important providers of health, physical, uh, mental, and, and social well-being in our communities as, as the, the third major um, headline. And, um, and also in our market report for 2020, I'm sure you, you've all, all seen that. Um, it's available through our Knowledge Center. We define, um, you can see it all right here, we define uh, intermediaries and aggregators as an important part of uh, the digital part of our fitness sector uh, ecosystem in the coming decades. Decade. Um, so therefore, we believe it's very important uh, to have this conversation about the role of intermediaries and aggregators uh, in our sector. As most of you will know, uh, certainly if you represent um, uh, operators across Europe, you will know that there have been some concerns about um, the role of intermediaries and, and aggregators. and. Uh, and, and we aim with this webinar being part of a wider uh, consultation that Europe Active has initiated on the subject. We, uh, we aim to uh, bridge that, um, those concerns and, and uh, make sure that, we, uh, that everybody who has concerns around intermediaries and aggregators across Europe, that they have their uh, questions uh, answered based on, on, uh, on, on facts and, um, and insight um, around uh, intermediaries and aggregators. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, this is part of a wider consultation of the industry with regards to, uh, to this subject. We have agreed with the intermediary, intermediaries and aggregators who are present on this call, um, Pietro from uh, Gympass and Benjamin from, uh, from Urban Sports Club, that, um, that we'll publish um, a database, database publication um, with a proper consultancy firm, um, like we're usually doing with, with, uh, with Deloitte. Um, to ensure the quality of the data, um, and that publication will be ready um, at the latest for uh, EHFF in April of 2021. And uh, we aim to look at the role of intermediaries and aggregators in an operator perspective and really uh, map out um, uh, this, uh, this subject and, and how the situation is based on facts, uh, facts across uh, the European ecosystem uh, at the moment. Um, and as part of that process, we also aim to, uh, to pre present um, a set of standards of engagement, which will uh, create trust um, and, and uh, bridge the gap that there might be between intermediaries and aggregators and, and operators and other actors across, uh, across our ecosystem. So come back to, come back to our panelists. We have Pietro from, uh, from uh, Gympass. We have Benjamin from uh, Urban Sports Club. And uh, last but certainly not least, Jennifer uh, from our ethics committee and our board uh, with your active, um, she will lead the conversation in the uh, second and third section of our webinar um, today. So with that, uh, we would like to, um, to start with Pietro, um, who will present a bit about uh, the, the business model of Jim Pass and, and how uh, they have been, been operating through um, COVID-19 uh, and aim uh, towards uh, the future. Thanks so much, uh, Pietro, for joining us today. Please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Let, just let me share my screen over here. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah? Great. So, First of all, again, it's a pleasure to be here and virtually meet uh, all of you uh, and see some familiar faces again. Um, hopefully we're gonna meet soon at FIBO once the lockdown is over um, and have uh, personal discussions again. So the idea here is to, for us to, to cover um, the Gym Pass value proposition, our business model, and explain in more details. And thanks for the opportunity to, to, to have everybody in the same page about our business model and answer any questions that, that might arise throughout the process here. Um, talking about the agenda here, 
cover two topics, uh, uh, Jim Pass Value Proposition and uh, some frequently asked questions that we received some from operators across the eight years that have been operating. Um, but feel free to ask any other questions and then we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, so first of all, starting with Jim Pass Value Proposition, uh, and please, uh, Jennifer and Andres, let me know if I'm, I'm out of time here and, and I can speed up a, a, a little bit as I have a couple of things to cover. Uh, but uh, to start with that, I, I would like to say that intermediaries are, are not uh, created equal in the same uh, as the gyms are not all the same as well. So we have, uh, we cannot put together a low cost gym sector with the studios or premium gyms. That doesn't make sense. And I think for us, it's grouping intermediaries into one entity, the values, the nuances, and, and the unique uh, entities that exist across the industry. So I'm going to focus on our business model and how we are helping the industry to get more people active more often. Um, moving forward here to, to start with our mission, which is a bold mission to, to defeat inactivity. Uh, our, the Gym Pass DNA is basically built on bringing new corporate users to our fitness partners by offering physical activity uh, uh, programming to corporations via these wellness initiatives, right? Um, and we do this globally at scale, uh, directly communicating the inherent value of, of physical activity with the employer and with their employees. So this is, this is where, this is our bold mission. And then it goes back to our win-win model that we have. Um, so we connect gyms, clients, and users with a win-win-win ecosystem uh, that create a positive uh, and, and mutually beneficial environment uh, to the industry. We have now over 50,000 fitness partners across the globe. 2.5 thousand large organizations work with us, um, operating in, in 14 countries uh, across LATAM, US, and mainland Europe. Uh, and as I said before, helping getting people active, it is the core of our business. So 70% of Gym Pass users uh, didn't have a gym or studio membership before joining Gym Pass. So going through the specific of, of the value proposition for each vertical that we operate. Uh, so we help transform employee engagement with physical activity. So for the corporation side, uh, it's all about increasing productivity and retention, decreasing healthcare cost and, and talent acquisition costs as well to be this one stop shop solution for them and centralized provider that could help them cater to all the employees needs and profiles. Uh, and at the end of the day to be an effective wellness investments with universal access for all employees. And as a result, more than 20% uh, uh, employee engagement that we have across, across companies. We're gonna see an example later on uh, where, where we reached 64%. So this is our core of our business. Um, on the employee side, obviously with the company investment, affordability is a big piece of the business model, the company investing on behalf of the employees to help them find new activities to start exercising. Um, and it's all about uh, engaging and maintaining communication with those companies. So having this educational communication, uh, talking about physical activity uh, and, and the social corporate context that we bring is super relevant to reach that 70% of people that haven't had uh, a membership before Gym Pass starts with that company. And last but not the least here, for the fitness operators, we're talking about increased corporate penetration and revenue, um, having the same profile and frequency as the current members to have a dedicated corporate sales team and enablement team on our side that would help uh, generate more users to them, corporate users with flexible terms. They can leave the platform at any given point in time. They can test, they can leave as much as they want. And as a result, we're gonna see some examples that on 80% of Gym Pass users are new members. So this is a couple of uh, incrementality studies that we do across the globe. And I'm gonna share a few examples later on. So if you have to leave with one thing today about our value proposition is slide, I think this is the one talking about how we help in corporations to bring uh, engagement up and, and tackle those challenges that they face, employees to bring to the market with an affordable uh, option for them to find a new activity to, to start their fitness journey and to the fitness mar uh, market. It's untapping this, this market, market, um, corporate market opportunity for them with these new users. So going a little bit more details about the corporate wellness opportunity and Deloitte have made a good study last year talking about the corporate wellness segment and the vision for the fitness market and what they saw on that study is that wellness is a priority for corporations. So almost 80% of HR departments, they are 
consider increasing their investment in physical activity programs. But to be able to do that, they need an attractive offer to cover all employees, price, location, and diversity, to have an integrated communication plan to engage with their employees, and obviously having that return on investment and change the behavior of their employees across time. This is the core that they saw on this, on this study. Uh, when they interviewed the fitness industry, what they saw is that 92% of the health and fitness provided, they would consider corporate wellness as a way to increase revenue. And a majority of them said there is a big opportunity for the near future. Um, the challenges that he saw in that study for operator side is working with corporate companies sometimes can drive to long sales cycle with multiple stakeholders. It's not a one size fits all approach. We have to bespoke programs to each organization. It limited coverage and one price tier could limit the, their approach here. Uh, it's a low ROI on the corporate sales team and marketing outreach uh, it, it, with uh, limited resources to, to go after that. And the third party B2B solution could help with uh, an inter or national uh, operation to reach the approach organizations to untap this corporate market, leveraging its expertise in our case that it built throughout eight years and, and capture this global client's opportunity improving your, uh, the operator's brand awareness. And how do we do it? So it's a couple of things that we, 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 we do it together combined with the large organizations to establish this successful partnership. I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but having this universal benefit to cater to the entire employee population from a blue collar employee up until the C-level, having the endorsement of the, of the top management is key to, to, to the result of the program. If they're not uh, behind this program, this will not work. We know this by experience, um, breaking down the barriers and, and getting people active. So frequently communicating uh, physical activity to be at the top of the priority of that organization, uh, fostering a joint business plan that we have clear goals with each organization to achieve success. All of this is part or of our uh, JBP. And that led to us having now 2.5 thousand corporate clients, as I said at the beginning, across the globe. Some, some logos over there, well-known logos. Um, and the one that I would like to highlight here, one case that uh, that's one of my favorite one, it's been uh, a few times now, it's a couple of years, but Unilever won uh, the Workplace Awards back in 2015 uh, uh, with a case that Jim Paz was the exclusive physical activity provider. So before Jim Paz, they have 23% of their population active. With the help of Jim Paz, we're able to almost triple that number to 64. And as a result of that, we're able to reduce high risk population and cholesterol population, and also smokers reduction as well, alongside with other programs that they have with emotional and mental uh, uh, and social well-being. With that program, every euro that they have invested uh, on, on the well-being program, they calculated 6.4 euro return. So going to the frequently asked questions, I know that I'm, I'm rushing a little bit here, but uh, I'm going out of time. So I'm gonna cover a few topics here that I know it's, it's, it's something that interests the public. So talking about anti-aggregators, mindset, operational distraction, protecting club capacity, customer cannibalization, and B2B team. First of all, as I said at the beginning, anti-aggregators, they all the same rights. So as I said before, no, uh, I think we are, we are focused on one solution to bring new corporate users to the market. So we are there talking to companies on a daily basis to get their company investment to float the fitness market with a new uh, opportunity. Uh, and as you can see, we are in the upper uh, right uh, chart over there. Um, the operational distraction, so I'm focused on the day job. Uh, we are we're fortunate to have been integrated with majority of the systems out there, CRM and booking system to be a seamless integration and quick rollout for our fitness partners. So it's a, a easy way, user-friendly way to, to see that. And also we have online reports that I can see all the time with all the information that we generate to the partners. The third point here is about protecting club capacity. Some cases I'm already full anyway, so it's more about a strategic uh, approach here on their commercial uh, way of doing business. So it's a strategic way of, of dealing with, with aggregators. So they can decide, they are free to decide if they want to go after a high volume and low yield, or if they want high yield and less volume, and we can cater for that on the plans that we offer to the companies. So it's, it's up to them to decide uh, what they want to do. It's not us to mandate what's the strategy that they have as a company. The fourth point here is about customer cannibalization. You're taking my clients. So I'm gonna cover two incrementality studies here, that on the, the one on the left and the one on the right. The first one on the left, it's a club that we started with them 
in 2017 with one club in UK outside of a corporate area. The challenge was exactly that if you can generate new corporate users for me outside of a corporate area, then we can talk about the rest of my clubs. It was a trial throughout 16 month period. Sales of that club operated above the company curve. Levers remained the same. There was no peak of people leaving. So that come back through the incrementality thing. Uh, Jim Pass added almost 200 new users and 3,000 pounds on a monthly basis. And EBITDA increased in 18% of that particular club. With that case, we're able to roll out to the, to the whole locations that they have and we've been fortunate working together for more than three years now. And the other one on the, on the right here is the uh, uh, UK national operator as well, 100 sites. We're able to bring 90% of, of, of new users to that club, 82% completely new. They never set foot to the club before and 80% we were able to recover the ones that canceled more than 12 months ago and 10% and of those just changed payment method. They're going via Jim Pass. So 90% is the incremental number. As I said before, 80% is usually the number that we see with operators across the board. And we have um, cases in all geographies that we operate. And last but not the least, corporate team. So we already have people on that. So uh, we appreciate that. And this is, as we saw in the corporate wellness opportunity from Deloitte study, uh, I think that yes, it's an opportunity that has to be addressed via uh, each local operator. We think that we are complementary solution for, for that. We are focused on a niche market, talking about the UK case here, 1,054 companies that are willing to invest in the program. So the future of that, it's more than uh, 10 office locations, so spread it all over the UK, uh, that are willing to invest with minimum of 5,000 employees and to be in the forefront of the well-being innovation to invest on something like Gym Pass uh, uh, as, as a membership. And, and we encourage the health clubs to go after the small clubs, the ones that are the vicinity would take part on that to, to get uh, people from, that, from, from, from those companies. This is not our core business. Our core business is the large organizations. So I think that's it. Sorry that I rushed a little bit because I know that I have a few minutes. So thank you all and looking forward to the questions. Thanks so much, Petro. Um, Benjamin, could we hand over, over to you? Sure. So hello everyone. My name is Benjamin. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of Urban Sports Club. And I'm very happy that we have a conversation and a webinar like this uh, on this topic, because I like really experienced also that there is some sentiment in the market and it's good that we all like come together, talk about it, discuss and, and find solutions. So uh, thanks again for your active for this initiative. I think it's exactly the, the right approach. So uh, let's, uh, let me uh, quickly share my uh, screen here uh, that I can tell you a bit about Urban Sports Club uh, and what we're doing. One second. Can you all see my screen now? Yes, perfect, thanks. Maybe let's start with, with our vision um, because some people might wonder what we're actually aiming for and uh, why we do what we do. So we're actually aiming for um, creating a world where everyone enjoys doing sports. And that sounds uh, maybe, maybe easy or on the other hand also uh, very ambitious, but we strongly believe in the connection of fun and sports activities, and that being a crucial aspect of making sure that people get more active more often. We believe that there is actually an activity, a sports activity out there for everyone. There are just so many people who haven't found yet the right activity for them. And we believe um, as an aggregator, we have the chance and we have uh, really the possibility to help people to find the right activity until they enjoy it, until they stick to it and, 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 it, and sports becomes a routine. And that's why for us, it's really important to have a great variety of, of different types of sports because people need to have the variety and the flexibility there to, to find it. Um, we, for example, well, I know we have most of the people here uh, in this webinar um, are coming rather really from the fitness sector, but I need, I need to point out that in, in many cities where we operate, we have actually uh, even more people doing yoga, for example, um, or other sports. So, Fitness is a crucial and a very important part of our offering, but it's not the only one. And there are others also of great importance um, because we, as I said, we, we want to make sure everyone finds the right activity and gets easy access, access to it. 
as a quick background uh, on Urban Sports Club. So we um, have so far a bit more than 10,000 uh, partner venues uh, across Europe on our platform. We operate in um, more than 80 cities in Europe, um, have, as I said, many different types of, of sports and uh, grew over the last years to a size of 450 uh, employees spread over all the offices um, in Europe that we have and actually grew quite fast um, in the past years. So you, you can see that uh, at least uh, somehow from, from the graph um, that we were um, yeah, facing quite an, quite an exciting growth, uh, of course, until Corona. Uh, we're gonna talk later about that. So we, of course, were also hit, hit by that um, and uh, needed to uh, take a deep breath during, during that time. Um, as Urban Sports Club, we're fully focused on Europe. So we have local teams in all seven countries where we operate because we really believe in this local approach where we have our teams very closely to, to the corporate customers that we have, but also to our partner studios, making sure we know what's going on in the individual market. We know um, what, uh, what are the needs of our partners and corporate clients. And we believe it's not possible uh, for such a business to, to run it, I don't know, from, from a headquarter, from a call center somewhere we believe uh, we need to be uh, strongly involved in the individual markets where we operate, um, hence the decision to act really locally um, instead of uh, just centered from the headquarter. On the right side, you see um, our partner networks in the individual countries where we operate and it becomes obvious being the strongest in Germany comes from our history um, as we headquartered uh, in, in Berlin and started in Germany first in 2012. We're now um, growing in the other markets um, over time, uh, getting to a similar um, uh, coverage um, as we have it in, in Germany. Let's have a look at our business model, because I think that's uh, what, what's uh, really relevant also for the discussion that we want to have today. Um, so we have customers coming from the B2C side and from the B2B side um, of the spectrum. Let's, let's start with our B2C segment. So these are members um, that uh, strive for variety, that uh, search for different activities that are not going to a single uh, venue every day, um, but rather need to have uh, the freedom of choice and um, uh, are usually not having a routine of going to a certain venue every, every morning, for example. So we, we need to inspire those people to get active, to stay active, and to find the right sports activity, as I mentioned at the very beginning. And then we have our B2B clients. We already heard in the prior presentation a couple of words on that. So that's quite similar. We focus on corporates who want to subsidize the sports of their employees. So we're not aiming for just getting out, I don't know, discounts for, for bigger corporations. No, we really want to engage with those corporates, making sure that we are aligned on the individual goals that they have for the employees, so becoming a more attractive employer, um, decreasing sick leaves, um, but also making sure that uh, really the, uh, the brand awareness of, of, of being an employer that takes care of their uh, employees is, is, is known. And we support those uh, um, corporates uh, with our uh, account management team during this journey, uh, making sure um, that they find the right way how to, how to foster and how to um, support the sports of the employees. Main focus always is we want employers to pay for that because otherwise we don't see the engagement of them, we don't see the penetration uh, at corporates. We want to make sure that really management and HR are fully aligned in the strategy and not just um, adding a discount um, to their benefits portal. With the membership fees that we receive from both customer groups, um, we of course pay our partners. Um, in our case, it's a pay per use. Um, model, so we agree on a payout um, individually with the, with the clubs joining our platform. Um, payouts can differ, it, it depends on the service uh, that, uh, that is provided. Uh, as you can imagine, if someone is just uh, opening, uh, offering a, a boot camp in a park where no uh, fixed cost supply and where um, like, uh, like the costs are just minimal, we, we don't pay as much as we would pay a, a gym in a, in a great uh, center location. Um, that has a pool, for example. So those payouts, of course, vary and um, always depend on the premium level and service that, that is uh, offered um, to the also uh, members um, of the gym that are uh, usually going there. What's also very relevant for us 
is that we have four different uh, membership types and we have that to differentiate basically the premium level of our partners. So whenever we start a partnership with a partner, we discuss our, our memberships and agree on what type of people do you want in your gyms and, and, and clubs and studios uh, to come from, from our side. So the clubs can decide whether they want uh, urban sports members uh, just from, from our L membership uh, or whether they uh, uh, agree that a price point of 59 euro uh, per month is, is sufficient, making sure that our memberships are always more expensive than the membership directly at one of our partners. Uh, we, we believe um, for the flexibility and for the freedom of choice, members need to pay more. And we also believe that uh, with this way, we can make sure that we don't interfere with the pricing strategy of our partners. So it's also, um, uh, of course, an opportunity to change after a while from an L to an M uh, access model um, or the other way around, um, always dependent on the needs of the partner and the situation that we're facing uh, locally. There's another tool that we provide to our partners, and that's a limitation of visits. So if a partner believes, for example, um, that 59 euro in the M membership is a differentiator, but would would prefer a, a stronger differentiation to its own uh, pricing model, we can, we can set limits. So we can set limits between four times, eight times and every day, meaning that a member of Urban Sports Club would be allowed to join that club just a uh, limited time per month. Also, again, here, this is always up to um, the, the wishes and uh, the needs of the individual partner um, and is then just set up and, and managed with our app um, that uh, basically deals with the whole access management for clubs. Um, the three memberships on the right, M, L, and XL, allow our members to do sports every day. Um, the S membership on the very left um, is actually limited, so allows you to do sports just four times a month. We recently um, started live classes as well. Um, you might have seen that uh, as well, and that was one of our major responses uh, to the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. So um, when, when that happened, and, and for us in our market, it became most relevant in Italy um, at the very beginning, um, we sat together with, with partner venues and uh, tried to understand how we could help them um, in the fastest way, and also how to make sure that our members uh, stay active as much as possible. So we created a platform um, that allowed our partners to live stream classes out of living rooms of, of trainers, but also out of the studios, in, dependent on the individual situation in the countries. And, and, that, and thus made sure that the members were still actually training with the people they knew, with the trainers they knew from pre-corona times, so to say. Um, and also on the, on the other hand, making sure that there's still revenue streams generated um, from our member base directly um, to the partners. And that was also then the major decision why not to go on on demand or other other models, but like still really focusing on the partnership between our studio partners and uh, our um, urban sports world. Another measure that we implemented during Corona, we said like we kind of created a bit of a revenue share model uh, for that time. Um, so we set up a solidarity fund and, and said that like all the all the member revenues that we still receive despite the fact that we, of course, also saw many people going on pause uh, during um, the uh, lockdown phase in, in all those countries. But we said that all of those fees that we get, we're gonna use to pay out first, of course, uh, for live streaming, but then every additional, like every revenue that is left um, and is in this bucket of 80% of the revenues that we receive, we're gonna send to our partners, independent whether they offer live classes or not, um, making sure that not we as, as an aggregator just profit maybe from a situation uh, like Corona, but that every money that we get is, is actually spread to, to the partners in a way, very similar manner as we do it um, in regular times, so to say. Um, that was an important measure and um, I think it was also very much appreciated by partners, but also by members, because for them it was also um, a possibility to show solidarity and um, to make sure that um, the partners are also there when, when the lockdown is over. Um, crucial, uh, crucially, of course, for, for all of us. All right, I think that was it for my, for my side to give you um, a better insight on Urban Sports Club and what we've done in the, 
in the past years and days. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion and, and questions. Thanks very much, uh, Benjamin. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Jennifer, who, re who is representing our ethics committee, in which our um, conversation around uh, intermediate. I'm frozen or you're frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. I'm, I'm back. Something, something happened with my worldwide web, wide web connection. Um, I think we want to start the conversation right now uh, with uh, your role as, well, actually, I want to start with the question. Uh, Pietro and uh, Benjamin, which one are you? Are you an intermediary or an aggregator? Uh, well, for us, I can say we are probably both. So the question is what, like, what people understand by, by saying aggregate and intermediary. I think most people just use it as a synonym. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I look at it, I see an aggregator, basically the one who aggregates all the sports activities in a city. And mm -hmm. that's our kind of aggregation side. Um, if we look at as the word intermediary, that for me sounds a bit like a lead generator, maybe someone who brings new people to a new venue in this case. If I look and into our um, members and uh, their reasons for cancellations, then I see that the uh, second most reason mentioned is that they signed up directly with one of our partners. So I think uh, calling us an intermediary is also definitely fair enough. So if someone shouts, hey, aggregator or intermediary, I always listen. It, it's, it's both. It's, it's and, 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 uh, and Pietro, which one do you identify with? I would say that, as, as we were discussing before, we are third party focused on bringing new people to the market. I don't relate to those two words too much, to be honest here. Um, what we're doing is, is working on behalf of those companies to bring corporate people to, to the fitness market. And it's, I would call it as extension of the corporate sales team uh, of, of the fitness partners that we are working on their behalf. Um, we, you can say that we aggregate the offer to cater uh, for the HR needs. So for the HR, they need to see that we have a solution that's universal, that will um, have, uh, as I said before on my slides, it's, it's, that has different pricing tiers, uh, different kinds of activities. So yoga, uh, a normal uh, a gym up into a sword uh, classes that we have on a platform, surfing classes that we have back in Brazil. So all types of different activities to cater employee needs for them to start exercise. So this is more like a, a pitch for, for the HR side, um, for them to have this one-stop shop solution. Um, and, and as we see for, uh, of our numbers, uh, and more than 70% of our people, they go to our members, they go to one place. So once they start exercise, they find an activity that they want to start exercising, uh, they act as, a, as the same as behavior as a, a, a own member of that uh, particular chain or, 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 or a boutique place. So this is kind of the, what we've been seeing in our, in our numbers and how we position ourselves. Okay, great. I think that I think that's an important clarification. And we were talking about a little bit before the call that that third party probably sounds like a lot more fun than uh, intermediary or aggregator because there's just so many syllables. So uh, third party from now on. Okay, so um, uh, I'm actually curious uh, from you both. I mean, we heard a little bit from Benjamin what what happened with. Uh, with urban sports clubs during um, during lockdown, but what what did you see in terms of your member activity with your services? Like what what was actually happening for your members during um, during the lockdown period? Maybe start with Pietro and then uh, Benjamin. Yeah, so I, COVID nineteen obviously impacted the, the the whole fitness market and and us as well. So we were heavily affected by that. Uh, created a lot of uncertainty. Uh, to our corporate clients, fitness partners, and users. Um, so I guess you know, we made a, de a decision as a company to, to, uh, to not wait for the crisis to be over. So we went um, to, to fulfill our mission to defeat inactivity and bring solutions mm -hmm. to, to the market and not actually waiting for the, the coronavirus situation was over. So basically, with all of fitness partners closed throughout this period, we, we have to evolve our, our value proposition. Uh, so for studios operators, I think similar to what Benjamin described over there, we also started the, the live classes. So mm -hmm. a way to generate revenues uh, to our partners, even whilst uh, they were closed by introducing these live classes to our 
corporate users. Uh, the numbers that we had was like 5,000 partners globally offering more than 400,000 hours of classes. Wow. Uh, we get up to 10,000 classes per day, hours per day. Um, so I think that that was good to see that that take up and, and, and the whole fitness industry embracing that, that new venture, the new adventure, I would say. Um, and, and we also helped our partners doing uh, incentive campaigns to have them on board because especially in Europe where we had a lot of operators with um, a reduced hours, furlough, ERTE, whatever might be the government support. A lot of them, they were with not the, the, the employees being able to, to promote those kind of offering. So for those examples, we are able to offer free on-demand content classes so they can share that with their own members. So not Gym Pass members, we give the platform for free, specifically for those um, those those operators that didn't have the possibility to do a live class and to monetize with the digital world, uh, but they wanted to offer something for their uh, for their own members, and they didn't have the access to it. So we were able to to share uh, with them, and we also hosted uh, educational webinars, articles, and tips on how to educate live classes. So that was something that everybody was learning from it. Uh, the whole the whole market. Um, so that was good to see. On the other side as well. We, we launched uh, uh, Jim Pell's Wellness, which is a, a, a new platform, which is a holistic approach to, to well-being, something that our corporate clients, they were demanding from us for quite some time for us to have not only physical solution in place, but tackling also mental, social, financial health. Uh, so now we have more than 80 apps covering those other areas of well-being and, and transforming the way that we approach well-being to be this holistic approach. And I guess I'm proud to see that we're able to help the whole ecosystem of clients, partners, and users to remain active uh, throughout this difficult time. Uh, although from, from some, some, um, some surveys that we have done, we know that digital, uh, it's, not, it's a complementary solution and it won't be there uh, like as, as a core part of the business moving forward. It will be part of the whole uh, uh, Omni uh, kind of uh, channel approach of well-being with people taking up some digital solution, but the core business that it is people going to the gym, I don't think that's going to be substituted uh, in the short term. So talking about the future here, I see that it's as a combination um, uh, for people to do it. Like an example, we did a, a survey in Italy uh, with the International uh, Fitness Observatory um, with all of our users over there, and 86% of those users they mentioned that they are desperate to come back to the gym and have these face-to-face classes again. And 14% said that they are happy with the digital offering. So I think that enlightens a little bit of how it's gonna be the future of the digital uh, solution uh, moving forward after COVID-19. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there, there's something that's missing when you're in the middle of your living room doing a class or looking at it on a tiny uh, telephone. Uh, the, the, the atmosphere and location definitely plays a role, and that's when you can see it. Benjamin, is there anything you'd like to add to, to your um, lockdown story with um, Urban Sports Clubs? Well, I mean, I pointed out that we uh, added live classes to our platform. Um, and I think it was a very interesting journey because you can imagine that when we did that in March, uh, thousands of studios who never did live classes before went onto a platform, needed to learn how this is going, needed to meet, uh, we're, we're meeting people, members who actually never joined live classes before. Um, mm -hmm. And then us being kind of in the middle of that, providing uh, the, the gateway, also being the first time in, in, in such a situation. So that was, uh, quite a challenge, I think, for everyone involved, but also a great experience to to learn and do this together. So we also invested quite a bit into webinars, into helping our partners to make the best out of this, um, but also giving legal advice, what's important, doing this online in comparison to doing that on-site, um, because we saw a lot of uncertainty looking into uh, GDPR topics here, um, where we uh, brought experts together, making sure that partners as like as a whole can profit from that and, and, and know what to do and, and what better not to do. Um, so I think that was a very, very intense time, um, but also showed us that the future is hybrid. So we believe um, that uh, our model needs to provide both um, from now on, basically um, the on-site classes next to the live streaming classes from our partner studios. Um, 
of course, making it voluntarily to the partner studios what to focus on and how much they want to offer from, from what type of uh, activity. But we believe the demand is definitely there, having also more and more people now in home working um, and having really a, a more flexibility, uh, work, flexible workforce here um, that leads actually to that demand and, and effect. Um, we invested quite a bit actually also into PR um, because we believe we needed to make sure now people think of live streaming and live classes when, when, when thinking about activity. Um, we, um, so we, so we ran, ran those campaigns, but also together with the national associations of, of fitness, we're trying to, to lobby to make sure that governments don't forget about uh, gyms and that it's important to think of when to open them again, because we saw some, some countries where we actually felt that uh, gyms were kind of left out of the, the discussion. So um, I believe that also brought uh, many associations stronger together um, and, and helping them here to, to push for a faster opening or of course with all the hygiene measures in, in place, right? So that was a, a strong journey which, which will continue. Um, and um, I believe it is uh, also most relevant for, for most of um, the, the partner studies now out, out there to come up with hybrid uh, offers uh, for their own members. Yeah, I think uh, obviously uh, that was the other thing I was um, interested in at, 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 at basic fit where my day job is. We, we saw a huge uptake of people participating in our um, either live streaming or, or um, virtual classes. Did, did you guys notice anything or were you able to monitor class participation and did, it, did you do any analysis of the, the audience? Was there any surprising um, things that, that jumped out for you there? Yeah, for, for us, we, we definitely saw that there was, especially in the first months, a, quite an uptick in terms of activity. So we saw people working out even more than before probably uh, due to the fact that they were, it was exciting to join those live classes. They saved some time on going there. Um, they were trying out quite different types of activities to find the right one fitting to, to them best doing sports in, in the living room. Mm -hmm. But we also saw now over time, uh, as we go, going out of the lockdown, that the activity decreases again. Um, and that the people who joined originally Urban Sports Club were not joining because they were interested in, in doing sports at home. They were joining because they want to do sports outside with other people quite often um, at, the, uh, at the venues. Um, and that's why we see it as a complementary part of our membership, but not the new focus. Right. Um, and I believe that's probably for everyone here um, in this talk. So we're not, we're not an on-demand platform or something like that. So we want to make sure people, people are active, but it only works together with, with the partner studios. And that's the main focus to do it on-site. Yeah, and it, I mean, did did you see that that people would be a hundred percent happy with the with the digital offering? Well, from our side, we are also way too expensive to to okay. do that. So uh, if you if you pay sixty euro a month, um, and on the other hand, you see that uh, YouTube and and others offer it for free or for 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 ten euro a month, um, that would that wouldn't work. So um, so we see it as a as a co combined offer. Um, and making sure you, 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 you stay connected to your studios and trainers as a differentiation to content on YouTube. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pietro, uh, before we move to the Q&A, um, any, any insights in, in the, the audiences that were generated from uh, hosting so many classes? Yeah, I think the two, two points there. First of all, uh, us, like being, we, we pivoted very fast to the digital world. So we were trying to have the best solution in place. So it took us a couple of weeks to get there. It was not instantly. Um, so yes, we saw a peak of reaching like 100,000 uh, online uh, digital users uh, utilizing that platform. And then I guess it stabilized afterwards. And with the reopenings, it's, it's a little bit going down now, especially in Europe with, with markets reopening. Um, and then coming back to the study that I mentioned before in Italy, 64% uh, of, of those people that were interviewed, that were GymPass users, uh, they have kept their workout from home during the COVID. So a big portion of that. And from those, 
42% uh, attended live classes or online video classes. Other ones, they decided to just uh, do their own schedule. They went for a run or something like that. So they didn't have like a clear, uh, following a clear path on, our, on the live class and the digital solution. Um, what they also said that they are 54% they are desperate to come back to the gym, but they are concerned about their health and safety. Uh, and 43% prefers to wait a little bit while to come back to the gym. Uh, and, and whilst 54% mentioned that they are preferring to train outdoors at the moment up until the situation is normalized. And, and I think that correlates as well with the trend that we're seeing of coming back to, to of the reopening. In, in Northern Europe, we can see Germany, for example, with already 50% of people coming back to, to the gyms and, and coming back to what we saw in Feb. Uh, we see Southern Europe, especially Spain and Italy, with less than 30%. There is like the effect from what we discussed about people concerned about coming back to the gym, but also I guess summertime plays a part here, especially in those two markets that it's already uh, starting to see that. And people, I think it's desperate to get some holidays and get out of home, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, if possible, let's not do a staycation this year. Um, okay, so now we've moved into our question and answer section and but this is honestly, I have now been the question facilitator for a few webinars. This is the most audience participation I think we've ever had that I've seen. Um, so I'll go ahead and pre-frame by saying uh, we, we won't get to all of the questions um, in 15 minutes, but the questions that we don't answer, we will answer for you and we'll post them on um, the, the COVID-19 section of the, the Europe Active uh, website where we're going to post the recording. So your questions will get answered if we don't get, the, get to them on the list. Um, so uh, the last question is for me. Oh, great. Um, is basic fit working with uh, gym pass and or urban sports clubs, uh, why or why not? Um, yeah, not at, not at this moment, uh, but again, our target market at Basic Fit isn't, isn't focused really on, um, on studio classes or, or all of the different uh, flexible variety. However, I will never say never, I see it as a, as a complimentary service because we do notice that many of our Basic Fit members also have um, a third party membership so that they can go to studio offerings and that's the benefit of having a, a, a budget membership. So who knows what the future will hold. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm squinting, but apparently I need uh, different, different glasses or something. Uh, won't the new wellness offering distract gym pass from delivering customers to gyms or is it the idea that it will attract new members? So this is for you, Pietro, over the additional content uh, that you created over lockdown. Yeah, good question. Uh, in our opinion, it, it's, it's about getting new members and it would help us to, to drive more people to start exercising. Um, the digital offer can be the first step for some people that might face what we call the gym intimidation for them at, at first step. That can be one step to get to, to, the, to, the, to the local physical facilities. We see that as a complementary, as I said before, um, the, the study that we perform in Italy shows that people are much more willing to come back to the gyms and start exercising again the way that they were doing before their fitness journey. Uh, but I think, yes, it will drive uh, new members as it's already driving. Uh, we are, we've been acquiring new members via the digital offering. Um, but I think it's a stepping stone to get to, to, um, to the physical facilities, I would say. So it won't be a distraction. And to be honest, this is, uh, helps us to get uh, corporate investment in the market. So we go there with a broader offering, uh, looking to a more well, uh, holistic approach so that our companies invest in mental health right now or invention, invest in financial health, that we can get that investment to bring to, to, to the market. So I think that would position us in, in a more strategic way to get the, the money and the budget from those companies to get in, that into the fitness market. Just show the relevance and the value of the service. Yep. Okay, um, I've got the, the next question. There's so many questions, it's hard for me to organize them, so I'm, I'm now going uh, in order. Um, but I'm gonna need your help with one of these. Can Benjamin share the incrementality of the B2C members to the partners versus the B2B members 
uh, given he has both channels within the UGG. What is UGG? I, I'm thinking about the, the fuzzy boots, but that's not correct. <laughs> I also thought first of, those, of that brand. Um, the UGG, sorry, I can't help you out with this, but I can help you out with uh, uh, B2C and B2B. So um, we have a, a split uh, in terms of members um, that is a 50-50 split, basically. So we have 50% uh, coming from B2C channels and 50% from, from uh, employers. We actually invested quite a bit into our uh, corporate offering um, because we uh, believe that this market has, uh, has a great uh, growth potential. Um, and I think there are many reasons and we are quite all here familiar with them. With them. So um, we increased our sales teams quite a bit and will actually ex uh, see um, a larger share on our side. I expect rather a 60-40 split in the future um, for B2B versus B2C members uh, coming via Urban Sports Club to, to the facilities. Uh, okay, and thank you. Um, uh, and I think this is a question for for you both. But what what percentage of the gyms that you partner with uh, will no longer be in business post COVID? Do you have a Do you have a sense of that? Um, sorry, go on, go on, Benjamin. Uh, me? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> so, um, sorry about that. Um, unfortunately, we. we that, that's going to happen, obviously, um, especially markets that um, the whole recession will hurt more. So we can see that South America, for example, Latam, we are seeing more of, of, our, uh, of our partners um, seeing some difficult times over there uh, because the economy was not strong. And then a whole recession is about to start globally. And, and obviously that will affect people going out of business. So we don't have a particular number uh, around that that we can forecast, uh, but yes, we're gonna lose a lot of partners, unfortunately, because of the recession. But up until now, we don't have concrete numbers to share. We, share, okay. we can share that later. Okay. Well, it's similar on our side. We don't have a concrete number. Um, we so far haven't faced like a, a, a huge wave of uh, partners uh, uh, giving up their business. Um, we believe actually this is wave, this wave is still to come. Um, so it depends really on how fast uh, the, the studios and, and clubs are able to get the members now back and all, on also our uh, members being back there um, uh, supporting uh, with, with the revenues. Um, we saw more uh, rather small studios uh, in, in trouble um, than, than bigger ones so far. But we also hear a lot of uh, consolidation rumors in the market. Um, so uh, I think there, I mean, we just heard about this huge uh, takeover from uh, MacFit and, and Gold Gym. So um, there's certainly more deals to come like that due to this uh, phase. But um, it, it's currently not the situation that we see that there are hundreds of uh, partners reaching out to us, telling us that they are um, out of business. I, I guess that's positive that you're not feeling it as uh, as overwhelming. It's just I think it's hard for everyone to get a to get a grip on that at this at this moment. Um, uh, so I have a uh, gym pass seems to be in a great position to bring more users through corporate clients into gyms and studios. How do they see that evolving post COVID? How have their conversations with HR and benefits teams evolved in the last three to four months? So good question. Um, I think when we launched the new digital offer, um, whilst the lockout was ha lockdown was happening, we saw companies that were seeking to opportunities to get their uh, employees at home physically active. So we saw like inbounds coming from companies that were not working with us, like prospects, reaching out to understand what we were doing and, and, and to get our solution in place. So we're able to launch within this period over 60 new contracts. So companies that were seeing the digital offer as the first step throughout lockdown. And then after that, obviously uh, having the physical solution in place. So it was a good trend uh, that we saw that, uh, as I said before, would help us get new people to the market and, and companies uh, willing to see that digital offer to, to support the employees throughout this difficult time. Uh, I think that was, was super relevant and, and interesting to see in this past three months. Thank you. Um, I had a great
great question, but it's scrolled away. Okay, I think this is uh, probably the last one we can take, but I think it's interesting uh, for both of you because you you both have the the B two B element um, in your party. Uh, but uh, what what is your uh, average level of engagement with companies in Europe? I don't know. Maybe if uh, urban sports clubs can answer this, but maybe is it a, is it a market that corporations are reluctant to give fitness benefits to employees or are you finding that, that they are really receptive to the to the conversations and uh, programs maybe Benjamin and then yeah, Pietro yeah. no it's, it's definitely a mega trend so to say for corporates um, to look into benefits and to add more and more benefits besides uh, like a classic salary um, and uh, we like looking also at the, the corporates that we're dealing with we don't see a big difference between, I don't know, larger corporate clients such as uh, AXA, for example, or SNCF or smaller clients um, where we talk about uh, SMEs, um, that the interest has like now declined or um, that they don't want to uh, invest in, into benefits um, anymore. So we rather also saw uh, that more and more uh, corporates now are wondering, okay, I'm, I'm not in direct contact with all my uh, staff anymore, so how do, how do I make sure that they still feel the benefits uh, because I don't know, coffee and soft drinks don't really help if, you, if you're actually at home. Um, so you need to find different ways and um, health will, will become more and more important. And actually that's what we all will benefit from is that the focus on health, not for only for corporates, but for all the societies, especially in the Western uh, world um, will, will be on, on health um, and uh, that our industry will definitely uh, evolve out of that as, as a winner and and that's also what we see and hear from from the corporates um, yes of course some of them are currently really facing short working and and and, and need to um, uh, hold their uh, belts tight but they all know that the future is investing into the health um, of their employees and that's why we see a strong demand there um, and it's it's further on growing great thank you Pietro last answer yeah, so we do see different um, kinds of engagement uh, with, with different profiles, size, uh, and, and engagement that we have with, with the companies that we work with. I can mention, for example, large retailers such as Tesco, Tesco Sainsbury's, Lidl, um, and, 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 and others that it's, it's, a, it's a hard population to reach out to. So it takes time for us to build that engagement. So usually we're going to see rich in maturity of the engagement level after 18 months to two years because of the, how complex it is to deal with that particular client. On the other hand, we have the consultancy firms or, or financial services that they are easier to, to approach the employees. We, they have a, a, a better way to communicate with them. So the engagement that we see with those companies are much higher, uh, faster than the other ones. Um, and, and then in average, I would say that in Europe, it's above 20% engagement. If you combine those two elements of smaller, medium, and large organizations between that bracket of 1,000 plus employees. Thank you very much. I, I will turn this over to uh, Andreas and, uh, and, and promise you that we'll answer the rest of your very long uh, <laughs> uh, line of questions uh, on the website later. But thank you for your interest. Thanks so much, Jennifer, um, and, and thanks, Pietro and, and Benjamin, for sharing your, your insight and expertise on this uh, subject. And thanks so much to the, um, to the audience for all your great and critical uh, questions. Uh, we'll make sure, as Jennifer said, to answer all questions. And, um, and there will be part of our official uh, process of our ethics committee towards um, April 2021, where we will, as I said in the beginning, uh, draft the... Um, report on uh, the role of intermediaries and aggregators in our sector, uh, principally in uh, an operator perspective. So thanks very much. Um, I just want to say a few things about um, the coming, coming couple of months for Europe Active, where we'll have the kickoff of what we call the, the Active Autumn, which will be uh, the great sort of um, list or set of events and initiatives by Europe Active in uh, September onwards. They'll be kicked off uh, immediately after the summer. Um, as we come back after the summer break in, um, in August. Um, we have a few very big events in August, being the European Week of Sport, the EHFF on the 30th, 30th, 30th of September, of course, uh, the EFAF Roundtable in Cologne um, in conjunction, conjunction with the EHFF. Um, we're launching the Active Leaders Program with, uh, with UK Active, 
coming back with updated standards for operating uh, through COVID-19 um, for clubs and uh, for fitness professionals. We're launching our President's Council of Operator uh, CEOs, um, binding the biggest employers of the European sector to some of our goals in terms of upskilling our sector and positioning our sector towards uh, public health. Uh, we're launching our new pub podcast series in uh, September as well, which is uh, which kind of takes over from uh, our very successful webinars during the uh, the lockdown period and the COVID-19 period. And not least, we are we are presenting our COVID-19 impact report in September, also in conjunction with the EHFF, uh, where we are we are looking deeply at uh, the impact of COVID-19. Uh, on our sector across Europe based on data coming from close partners like Deloitte, uh, Four global and others. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. This is the last webinar in the long series of, uh, of Europe Active educational webinars during uh, the COVID-19 period. And um, I just want to say um, a big thanks again to uh, our audience and our followers uh, for, um, for tuning in every Wednesday and Thursday uh, over the last uh, several months. It has been a, a great journey. So we, we have learned a lot about uh, conducting webinars and we've tried to do our best to uh, ensure the best of expertise and knowledge and insight through our webinars uh, to smaller and bigger um, actors of the sector across Europe. So thanks so much. And we're looking much forward for a smashing um, September with you as a smashing kickoff uh, of the active autumn with our partners across Europe beginning in um, September. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll make sure to come back with answers for your uh, many questions. Thank you. Have a great day.